Hello everyone, the Instant Camera Guy here, and welcome to what will be a continued discussion on the use of lithium-ion batteries in modern Polaroid i-type cameras. Um, again, before I start this video, my intent here is merely to have a critical discussion of the use of non user replaceable lithium ion batteries in the modern Polaroid i-type cameras and I want to go into I guess a few points today um, which explore I guess some of the main arguments that people can tend to come up with in terms of promoting their use. Now I'd like to point out I have nothing against lithium ion technology itself. In fact I'm a huge proponent for the use of lithium-ion rechargeable double A's and triple A's. Uh, these are by a brand called Kratex. These are incredibly awesome things. But what I do take issue with is when a lithium-ion battery is baked into the design of something and not able to easily be user replaceable. And pretty much every modern i-type camera since the Instant Lab introduced in 2013 through to the Impossible Project i1 introduced in 2016 and then the modern One Step series, the One Step 2 of which I have an example here today, uh, through to the Now, the Go and the brand new flagship Polaroid i2, they all have some kind of lithium ion battery which is buried within the camera itself and not easily able to be replaced. And the type of battery that they typically use uh, is what is called a lithium polymer battery. It comes in a little soft pouch. So this is the kind of battery that you do need to quite kind of protect. It doesn't have a hard cell like you would find in other uh, battery options that are say AAA sized um, or any cylindrical models. So they are fairly soft, so they do need to be contained within something. But this is the kind of style of battery that Polaroid typically use. And I teased this camera in the last video I did about this particular subject. It got featured very briefly. I had a lot of people question why I put a cold shoe on it, ask what the body panel was on the side there. Well, I'll go into that in just a second. Now, before I go any further, I would like to point out again, like I did in the start of my last video, my intent here is not to criticize people, but what I typically have noticed when I've done video commentary on this sort of subject is a lot of people get naturally defensive of their iType camera. Um, now this is typically people that already own an iType camera, whether it be a one step or a, or, or a the Go or the Now, or the, especially the Polaroid i2. And I think people naturally take the criticism that I'm levying towards these cameras and defensively go into a sort of mode where they go, hey, he's insulting what I own. Now, that's just a normal byproduct of the human psyche, but please note that I'm not insulting you, I'm merely pointing out some flaws on a particular product. And when the, impos uh, the impossible, when the Polaroid Originals i2 was launched at the end of last year, the one thing that I noticed is that on its launch, there was a whole stack of YouTubers that had, were sort of within the first day or two, all posting reviews, and they had all these very tastefully edited together videos, and a lot of what they'd received must have been, uh, I'm going to assume, either gifted to the so-called influencers, or they were provided by Polaroid as some kind of rental or some kind of uh, uh, option to purchase the camera before it became on sale because these videos were all edited together weeks before the actual product was launched. And one of the, th one of the things that I found particularly in relationship to the i2 is that everyone had these wonderful glowing reviews um, and no one touched on any of the negative points. Um, and so when I released a video saying, well, that's all well and good to have a very expensive camera, um, but why is the battery in it still built in and not user replaceable? What I found was that about 80% of my followers tended to unanimously agree with me, whilst the other uh, sort of minority became very vocally defensive, <laughs> and I'm not entirely sure why. Um, and one of the, what I wanted to do on this video, in addition to, I guess, uh, offering a rebuttal to some of uh, what, what they had said 
was really just explore some of the most common excuses that are given by manufacturers for the use of rechargeable lithium ion batteries. And then what I aim to do is show that there's really no excuse for those excuses. So um, the first thing that I just want to point out is someone suggested that I was just being negative for the sake of getting views and uh, you know somehow I wanted to save my brand because I refurbish SX70 and apparently these iType cameras are such an existential threat to my business that I was merely being negative to save face. Again, it's not true. I I, I offer repair of these cameras too, so it doesn't matter, it doesn't bother me. I'm still getting money regardless, so it's not about that. Um, another common argument was because I somehow didn't own the camera that I, I didn't have the right to complain about it. Um, that Like, that's just not how the world works. <laughs> if I see something and I go, hey, that's stupid, um, I'm not gonna buy that thing, but I might point out that it's stupid so that my opinion gets reflected in others. Like that's just, <laughs> that's, how dumb is that? Like, like, like bad design transcends ownership, <laughs> right? Like you're allowed to criticize something if you, even if you don't own it. Like that, that's just such a non-excuse. Um, but the main thing that I wanted to talk about today was some of the most common arguments as for why Polaroid need to use rechargeable batteries and particularly why they they build them in. Now I think a lot of these arguments come from cell phone manufacturers. So here I have my old Samsung Galaxy S8. Um, I mean what this phone would be six years old or something like that. The battery lasts like an hour max. Like if I'm constantly watching the screen the battery dies. I, I pretty much would have to keep this on charge the entire day. And unfortunately the Galaxy S8 is a curved screen, it is entirely glued together. If you go to the iFixit guide for the, the Galaxy S8, it is basically as hard as you can possibly get to take apart a phone. And this is the case with a lot of phones these days still. Now, there is some momentum in the form of forward thinking um, and environmental sustainability that is slowly forcing manufacturers to get their products to be uh, more user replaceable, more right to repair kind of stuff. But it is taking a hell of a long time. And it's because of people like me constantly pointing out the flaws and getting momentum that things ever change in the first place. And this phone annoyed me so much. The fact that like to, to get this thing repaired, like was the price was exorbitant. And the phone that I owned before this was the Samsung Galaxy S3. And that had like a user swappable back. I, I had three batteries for the thing so that if I went traveling I would have enough phone charge for like two days of solid use um, because the back would come off. Now some of the most common arguments for phones not having that user replaceable back, uh, you know it keeps it slimmer which okay it's true you might be able to shave a millimeter or two off the shape of the phone. Another argument is uh, it makes it more waterproof which again is I guess it's it, that's true but like, do we really need those things? Like I I'm not going surfing with my phone. I live in Australia, which, you know, we're a very water loving people. We love swimming pools and love going to the beach. There's been no case where I've ever gone, gee, I wish my phone was really waterproof. Like I've never dropped my phone into a toilet or, or anything like that or got it wet beyond a few splashes. Um, and the Galaxy S5, was waterproof and still had a user replaceable back. It had these uh, rubber seals that went around it. So look, I don't really buy those as an excuse on phones. And as a result, I certainly don't buy it as an excuse on a Polaroid camera. This thing is not waterproof at all, <laughs> right? You can't take this underwater. How is the film supposed to eject, right? So I don't buy that. And one of the biggest, uh, I think, arguments that people have is, oh, well, if they use a built-in battery, it makes the device slimmer, right? Adding adding a battery door of some kind, uh, I, I had people say in the comments, would introduce like the possibility of light leaks or somehow compromise the structural rigidity of the camera. I literally had people commenting stuff like this. Um, what structural rigidity needs to be compromised by adding a little door? Like there were, what a ludicrous, like think about that critically for a minute. Think about what you're saying if you're arguing that point. Wh what a load of nonsense. How strong do you want this thing to be? It's a Polaroid. Like, it's an instant camera for taking fun, artistic snapshots 
at parties and things like that. Like, do you want to drive, be able to drive a car over it? Like, what what do you want of this thing? Like, it's such a, it's such a stupid, <laughs> it's such a, like such a non, a non thing. It's like inventing a problem to solve. Do you get what I'm saying here? So I certainly don't buy the use of lithium ion batteries for waterproofing because that's just moot in a camera like this. I certainly don't buy it as an excuse for, uh, making the camera more compact because again we're talking about a polaroid like look at the size of this thing here it's already a chunky camera this is basically the smallest kind of design that you can possibly make a camera and it is still pretty large in fact it's not that different to the original model polaroids which maybe i'll just grab an original one step so we can do a side by side comparison This is a Polaroid 2000 that I was working on. Um, again, in fact, the original is actually slightly smaller, <laughs> right? The footprint is is nearly nearly identical. It, yeah, and the original is actually a little bit shorter. It's actually smaller. I've never actually held these side by side before. Now, admittedly, the batteries that ran these things were also built in, but into the pack of film. But you get what I'm trying to say. Um, it wouldn't, like it's already a fairly large camera. What does it matter if you add a little bit of extra bulk? Like we're talking literally millimeters here, less than five millimeters is all that it would take to punt, like to increase the size of the back and add a little trap door that allowed a user replaceable battery. Um, another camera that I'm gonna show you here, because as someone in my last video where I talked about the Polar Studio uh, battery adapter that went on the base of my client Jeremy's camera, this had the same kind of issue, right? Um, it's a new bottom panel, it adds USB-C charging and it's got a battery in there. And Polar Studio, Johnny who runs it, specifically made it more compact because he did have an original model which was slightly longer that had a trap door that you could replace the battery yourself. And just for the sake of making the camera slightly shorter, he deleted that functionality. So this means that in a few years when that battery dies, you have to completely dismantle the back of the camera. And as I pointed out in that video, look how long the camera is already. It's, it's nine inches long. What's it matter if you add an extra three millimeters here? Like we're not talking about the difference between like, oh, well, you know, if we had a rechargeable battery, the camera would be this small. It would be, it would be tiny. Like, like look at this miniature Polaroid we could make. No, the camera's always gonna be as big as the film. Um, and someone in the comments section said that it would ruin the aesthetic if it had like a little door. Like, I, 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 like somehow seeing seams for a battery door would ruin the aesthetic all that much. Um, I'd like to point out Berkey already did that in the 70s with their Keystone cameras. The Keystone Wizard was a, uh, I actually, I really do need to do a separate video on this, but if you've never seen these cameras, these were introduced about 1975 and were the only SX-70 cameras produced by a company other than Polaroid. And believe it or not, they were the first Polaroid film cameras with a built-in flash. So they made this camera called the Everflash. It took SX-70 film they're a really cool piece of kit. I'm gonna do a video on them one day. But this is the flash model. And in case you didn't notice already, because they made it look pretty seamless, it's got AA batteries that, that hold, uh, it's got a trap door for AA batteries that power the flash unit. Uh, again, it's slightly chunkier than, you know, say, <laughs> the modern one step, but but not by much. Like it's it's basically the same footprint. Like. How much more compact are we really talking here? And yes, this was earlier technology. It had to have a few, a huge flash capacitor and this big reflector in there. So this is a chunkier camera for sure. But like, is it that much of a difference? Do you see what I'm trying to get at here? Like how is adding a little battery door going to add such huge bulk to the camera that it makes it not worth it? Like it, it just, it staggers me. Um, I also had someone else leave a comment saying that, you know, they had worked for a company making drones or it was their friend's company or something like that. It was either his company or a company he'd worked for or is his friends of a friend's company. I can't remember the exact story, but in that one, he said that they were using lithium ion batteries in their drones and they would have trouble with people 
replacing them the wrong way and causing fault and like the warranty but because of that because of this battery disuse was costing the company a fortune and they nearly went bankrupt again i don't buy that as an excuse because we've had lithium-ion battery tech for years right i've i've brought this up before like this is a sony Mavica from 1997 it had rechargeable lithium-ion batteries and I'm sorry, but that's not hard to replace. You can't screw up the positive and negative. You can't short circuit the camera. It's just a little pod <laughs> with terminals in it, right? That allow you to replace it. It's not hard. Um, but I got so irritated with like having so many people make comments that just, when you thought about it critically for a second, fell apart instantaneously that I decided one night, this is about a week after I released my criticism video on the Polaroid i2, which is coming by the way, I am, oh how, you guys will love this, hang on, I'll just digress for one second here. I'm getting sent a Polaroid i2 that belongs to a client of mine, he's going to let me borrow it for a while so I can do a bit of a, a review video on it and talk about it more in depth there. Uh, he sent it to me through DHL. Uh, only to receive the camera back again because, and I can't explain how delicious the irony is here, it got sent back because it contained a lithium ion battery and they didn't want to ship it. <laughs> so if that isn't the most ridiculously ironic thing that I've ever heard, I... So if only there was a way to just remove that battery, right? <laughs> <laughs> then I could have, they could have easily shipped it to me express. How ridiculous. But anyway, what I'm trying to get at here is despite most people agreeing with me that yes, what my argument was saying that the batteries in these things should be user replaceable, the small minority were just so loud in my mind that I, like, I, I, I just... All I could do was think about it for days. And I was thinking about that, oh, but it adds bulk. Oh, but you know, it's it will destroy the structural rigidity. It'll add light leaks, all that kind of crap. Um, and I decided, do you know what? I'm just gonna prove that it can be done. And that's what this panel is on the side here. Um, the battery for the, uh, the Now and the One Step 2, the One Step Plus is located just under the viewfinder because in this part of the, the molding of the plastic, there's actually like a big void that's in there. And right underneath the viewfinder sits the capacitive that uh, holds charge for the built-in flash. But below that is really nothing. Like it's just a little hollow section. And so that's where the battery sits. And I was thinking there's no really any excuse that they couldn't have had a little sliding panel so that you can access that battery. It would not have been hard to engineer. Um, and one of the other arguments that I had was, well, technically you could market these towards children because they're cute, I guess. Uh, and maybe a child would, I don't know, eat the battery or something like that. And so what I decided to do after a few beers, mind you, so this is, this is literally, I am several beers in, I've probably had at least four to five standard drinks. I'm so annoyed reading these comments on my Instagram that I went, do you know what? Screw it. And I said to my wife, I'm going to the workshop. <laughs> and so I went there at about 8 p.m. and I came back at about 10 p.m. with this. And what I've done, uh, I took the body panel apart. I used, I marked up the bit that I wanted to cut out and then used a Dremel, a drill and a file to cut out a little section. Then I cut a correspondingly sized piece of aluminum and I drilled two holes and I added two screws. Uh, these screws actually, ironically enough, came from a Sony Mavica that I had torn down because uh, it arrived broken and smashed from eBay. So the Sony legacy continues. And what I did, if you want to change the battery in this now, you just loosen the rear screw uh, and you just slide it up. And there we go, proof of concept. The other thing that I did, um, I've spoken about this, I think in the last video, but Different manufacturers for these battery cells use different connectors. Um, the industry standard is what they call a JST connector. Now Polaroid decided to use mini JST connectors on their One Step series, which makes the camera just that much harder to
to find a battery for, so you actually need to do a bit of soldering if you want to replace them, because I haven't been able to find any off-the-shelf battery components that would fit. But what I ended up doing, I snipped the leads off the original battery that was in this that no longer held a charge, and I actually found that this lithium-ion battery takes the same connector as the fan header on a computer graphics card, and so what I was able to do was uh, I took <laughs> I took the connector off the graphics card and uh, just soldered it to the original battery leads, and now we have what is a user replaceable battery system. It just plugs and plays. So I've got a little lead extension there. I can buy these from eBay. It's just a literally an off-the-shelf component. So this battery is called a Nino. 250p um, is supplied by an Aussie company, so hashtag support local. Uh, it's 850 milliamps, which is more than enough to power this thing. And it's now completely user replaceable. The actual film chamber is completely protected in here, so there's no light leaks, there's no possible way that light can get into the film. And whilst you could argue that, well, the flash capacitor is a little bit exposed there, none of the actual bits that will zap you are exposed. This is just a, a plastic tube. And had the factory thought about this in the future, they could have covered that with a little sheet of plastic. But again, this is literally me at night, several beers in, <laughs> in a garage, using over-the-counter power tools, coming up with a battery solution, that Polaroid should have just done in the first place. And literally, that's that's all you need to do. You just tuck it in, tuck the leads down there, and you can just put it back. Now, obviously, the method that I've chosen like is, is relatively crude, but what I'd like to emphasize here is that I literally haven't changed the footprint of the camera at all. It's the same size. I've added one millimeter of aluminium, but because of the shape of the camera, it hasn't actually added any thickness. So the camera is the exact same footprint as before, but now it has a battery that I can swap any damn time I want to. Effectively making this what might be the world, the world's currently the only one step two in existence that actually has a battery that you could swap in the field, assuming you had a little screwdriver, um, or that you can actually uh, replace the battery of without disassembling the camera. Because to get inside that battery compartment, what you must do, two screws here, I believe the base panel then slides off. There's either another two or another four screws. You've got two screws under the gray plastic housing here and about five clips. Then you've got, I think, another four screws on the inside, and that allows you to slide the rear panel off. It is quite the ordeal. And then, like I said, because there's no over-the-counter replacement with that mini JST connector, at least that I could find easily, um, you then have to do a little bit of soldering just to make sure the leads all connect. So, I mean, of, of all the one-step of all the modern i-type cameras, I should say, this is one of the easier ones to take apart. But I think I counted something like 10 screws and five clips that you needed to undo just to get into the part where the battery was, which I've proven, <laughs> I'll reiterate again, that someone, after several beers, in a garage, with no formal engineering degree, <laughs> can do with over-the-counter tools, like, there's just no excuse for this, and that's why I've written here, I got my label maker and I put reject planned obsolescence. I mean, technically these cameras don't become obsolete when the battery dies, but I guess you could call it like planned death? Planned... Uh, I don't know, what would be a better word than planned obsolescence? Because planned obsolescence isn't really, I guess, the best way to describe what's going on here. Because making something obsolete is like, you know, you make a camera for a certain type of battery and then you discontinue it and so, oh, it's obsolete, you can no longer get parts for it now. That's, that's a little bit different. This is like building it in with a used-by date. And as far as I'm concerned, if the battery isn't something that your average user can replace on their own, then the average user is not buying a camera, they are renting a camera. Until that battery dies. So, I think that's where I want to leave it for now. Um, 
I don't really have anything else to say about this camera, um, other than the fact that, yeah, I clutched it together. There you go, so you can see it's all powering up. Um, totally works. <laughs> and it's been working ever since. When I bought this, it didn't hold a charge, so I was able to pick this up really cheaply. Um, but yeah, I'd like to emphasize again, like, my my goal here is not to be, like, critical and, and shit on people that have bought this. My goal is to point out the design flaws of not just this camera, but really all Polaroid cameras so that people can have the best experience. And if you think that I'm just complaining about modern Polaroids, well, you haven't watched my channel at all, have you? <laughs> because half of my content is literally me tearing apart old SX-70s going, that's dodgy design, they used bad silicon here, they went cheap and started using rivets here, they made that poor quality plastic. It's me pointing out all the flaws so that people are aware of them, so that when they break, people can fix them, and so that they know going in, because what's the use of doing a review that's all rosy and all well and good when you're not going to spend at least a second to go, hey, you know, you might want to think about the fact that it's somewhere between two to five years time, that battery's likely going to start going south, and what are you going to do when that happens? Because I don't see anyone else but me harping on about it, and I kind of, I'm wondering at the moment, like, am I just crazy? <laughs> like, is this just a fair, am I the only one being affected by this? Have people been so softened up by modern manufacturing practices, like what smartphone manufacturers do, that they're just happy to accept this? I mean, this whole battery saga that started last year when I unleashed my criticism towards the i2, my, my Galaxy was dying anyway. It actually inspired me to go out and buy a Fairphone, which is a sustainable phone company based out of the, out of the Netherlands, that make phones that basically have the features that phones had 10 years ago that modern manufacturers started to, to drop. And it's got a back that I can just pop off. It's got a battery, which you can see here, that I can access. It's got screws that hold the thing together. And, I mean, it's not that much th thicker than like a modern iPhone. I've held them up. It's, it's somewhere in between the new Galaxy S24 and the S24 Ultra, you know, like the really big, almost like a netbook looking, looking thing. What do they call them? It's almost, the, the, the Galaxy Ultra is like a tablet. It's so huge. Um, but like there's, there's not a lot in it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like this is, uh, what did Macklemore say in that thrift shop song? I, I call this getting tricked by a business. <laughs> Like, are you that desperate for space in your wallet? Are you that desperate? <laughs> like, how much space are you saving? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's like one of those arguments that doesn't exist. You know, it's like people have manufactured it and tricked you into thinking that something is a certain way. And so, yeah, really... That's my main take home point from this video. I just want people to think critically about this subject and I'm gonna continue to dive deep into this. This will not be my only eye type camera. Um, I often get asked by people on this channel, oh, when are you gonna cover X, Y, Z topic? Well, if it's a repair, I'll cover it when I get that camera for repair. So if you've got a one step two that's no longer holding charge, send it my way. Um, I probably won't be doing this mod since that was time consuming and I need to drink a lot of beer if I'm going to do this, but I can easily swap it out. Like it's, it's an easy, easy enough thing for me to do as a technician. I just wish that I didn't have to do it, especially on a camera that's so modern. Like the fact that it's got such a glaring design flaw that no one talks about. Um, but yeah, if you want me to actually do a teardown video of it now, if you want me to take apart an i2 and see what it's like inside, send one over to me. Um, I'll do repair as long as I have things to repair on this channel. But if I don't get people send me stuff to fix, then I'm not going to show it anytime soon. But yeah, this is not going to be my only iType content. As I said, I am having someone ship me an i2. So when that does finally arrive, after they decide that lithium ions can go on an aeroplane, uh, I will be covering that in a little bit of detail. Um, but yeah, it's not the it's not the last you'll hear of me from this, um, and I'm really making 2024 my year of just at, at least telling people. I mean, I can't make this change on my own, but 
everyone that has been making Polaroid products with built-in non-user replaceable batteries, I have told. So I've already messaged Johnny from Polar Studio and said, oi, figure out a better solution. I've already messaged uh, some of the dongle manufacturers for the SX70R to make sure that the batteries that are being used in those are as easy to replace as possible in the future. I've, or, I've tried to message Polaroid about this topic to at least get an answer on what people can do if their camera has died, because as far as I'm aware, the support is just kind of non-existent. Like these cameras are warranted for about a year. I think the i2 is warranted for two years. I think you'll have to Google that. Don't quote me on that. Um, but there's no support. Like I think if the battery dies under warranty, they'll swap the camera for you. But after that, it's like you are on your own to feel your way around the universe and try and find someone that can swap it. Or if you feel like doing a DIY project one Sunday afternoon, you can tackle it yourself and order some battery parts off Amazon or something. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really all I wanted to talk about. Um, and then the last thing I'll add, the cold shoe I added there for a fisheye viewfinder, I actually had um, Retrograde Engineer send me some fisheye lens adapters. Uh, well, not fisheye lens adapters, 37mm lens adapters that I was going to use on a fisheye lens because the front lens housing does come off. Um, during my interstate move, I put them in a box somewhere, put that box into storage, and I have no idea where they are. <laughs> so, I do really want to turn this thing into a little fisheye camera. Um, how do I get this back on? I'll figure it out soon enough. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, he, he has designed an adapter to allow the use of 37 mil filters. Um, I just don't know. <laughs> don't know where it is. He sent me two. I'm so sorry if you're watching Retrograde Engineer. They're in a box somewhere. I haven't, I haven't lost them. I just, I just don't know where they are in my possessions. <laughs> um, but anyway, as always, if you love what I do, Feel free to send me uh, a, a donation through my coffee account. Links are below. Feel free to buy me a beer or two so that I can do more crazy mods like this and prove more points. Um, if you want to send me a camera to refurbish, maybe it's an iType with a dead battery, please feel free to get in touch. Um, and just in general, um, thank you for your support. If you give me a like or a share or a subscribe or a donation, it does mean the world to me. I'd like to give a shout out to Andrew again, who sent me a donation um, through my coffee account. Words can't express what that means to me. You guys with your generosity are what enable me to keep this little channel alive. And at the moment this year, I'm basically doing repairs as a full-time job. So I have gone from doing this as a part-time cash flow positive hobby business to now this is my full-time career. So. I'd like to emphasize just how much it means that you guys are out there enjoying my content, watching what I do, sharing my stuff around, most importantly, sending me stuff to fix and earn a living off. Um, I can't thank you enough. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Again, I'm not shitting on anyone that has purchased these cameras. I just want to make my point that the batteries in these should be user replaceable and until until we show manufacturers that we, we demand change, they'll just keep doing this and they'll just keep getting away with it. Um, and having spoken to the head of Polaroid Australia, he wasn't aware of how bad the battery issue was. And having advertised this year that I can fix these, I didn't even think that I know how bad it was, right? Because it's certainly far worse than I actually could have anticipated. Um, anyway, that's my two cents. Um, I will see you in the next video and happy shooting.